Hi everyone and welcome to the making of Blossom. So this was done a few years ago. She had closed eyes. When I do closed eyes I use a ball. I just cast it in the color of the clay that I'm going to use and it's just helpful to have that round sort of solid thing in the face that you can work around like an eye rather than trying to imagine it and making sure that they're both the same size and all that kind of thing so i just cast it in the size of the eye in order to do that i've made myself a mold for closed eyes so basically just press the clay into it and there i have it i just bake them first and then i can use them so she had very pale skin so for pale skin i usually use a lot of femo beige mixed with Cernet, always use Cernet and Fimo together, sort of 50-50 mix, because I find that that gives me a nice clay to work with, it can blend into itself. Fimo on its own is quite firm and I find that it kind of cracks when you try to sort of blend it, but adding the Cernet gives it more of a softer feel. And it bakes very strong if you bake it at the Cernet temperature, which is 130 degrees. Fimo is 110. Obviously, if you have Cernet in your mix, you do need to bake it at the higher temperature. When I make the smiling mouth, a lot of the time, not always, I do make the mouth without the teeth in it. So I basically sculpt the whole head without the teeth and the tongue, and then bake it, paint it, and then add the teeth and the tongue after I've done all that, because that does help prevent paint getting on the teeth when you paint the mouth but I must say lately I have actually tried sculpting the mouth while everything is raw still because the one thing that I find is, is difficult when you do sculpt the mouth without the teeth is that you have to imagine where those teeth go and you, you, you can use measurements to help but you never get it exactly right so I still like that way of doing it though I mean I don't think it's much that much of a problem as long as you measure to be anything to really worry about unless perhaps you were doing a portrait where you really did have to get it perfect but I do find it's very helpful to sculpt the mouth this way and paint it and then only add the teeth because sometimes you get paint on the teeth and then it's the whole thing you've got to try and get it off and make them nice and white again as always I painted this face in Genesis paint always use Genesis paint I set the layers with a heat gun but at the end when I have finished painting I always put the whole thing face back in the oven, bake it for 20 minutes, 15-20 minutes, which really sets the paint and m makes it sort of, it almost brings out the colour, it makes it very combined with the clay almost, feels like it's much more in the clay and not just sitting on the top. So definitely at the end always make sure that I bake the painted head for 20 minutes. I also like to do that because you then have to take the head and put it onto the body, onto the armature, and then you're dealing with adding raw clay again. I want the, the paint on the head to be very well baked so that I don't have any of the paint coming off. I think if you just use the embossing gun to set your paint, I would feel like it might come off a little bit when I'm you know, using all the oils that come out of the raw clay and just generally touching the head. For her, I just used very basic basic colors. I didn't do much of a colorful makeup. She's going to be a fairy and I wanted her to look quite natural. I say natural, her hair was pink, but you know, I didn't want bright colors or anything on her makeup. But I always paint the eyes in the way that I would do my makeup, just dark on the corners and sort of, yeah, sort of blending it in the way you would if you were doing eyeshadow. And as you can see from the pictures of the painting, I've painted the mouth inside, so I can paint the dark where the mouth, you know, so that the mouth looks deep. So I use a dark colour in the mouth, and because I don't have any teeth there, it won't get on the teeth, so it's quite helpful in that way. I sculpted the hands using an armature as I always do. I find that armatured hands I think are stronger, although I did do a test a while ago, quite a long time ago actually on Patreon, just testing the strength between a armatured hand and a non-armatured hand. There wasn't a whole lot of difference in the strength, but I do think at the end of the day, what I did find was there were a few cracks that developed if you bent the non-armatured fingers. And of course, if that was on a armature, you wouldn't have to worry that the finger was ever going to fall off. Not that you ever want cracks at all, but I was really putting those fingers under a lot of pressure. I was bending them quite, quite hard. And that's never going to really happen. But I'm so used to sculpting hands on an armature that I find it actually very difficult to, to sculpt hands without. The only time I ever do sculpt hands without is if I want the hand to be touching something because you do want it to look like it's really resting on whatever it's touching and I find that if you have an armature it sort of lifts the hand slightly off because it bounces back and then it just looks like you've kind of hovering your hand above where you're supposed to be resting it and that can look a bit awkward then I move on to the feet nowadays I don't actually I mean this what as I say this is a work in progress from a few years ago these days I don't make my feet separate because I find that 
you need each part to work with with the next part so the feet will relate to the bottom of the legs and the bottom of the legs relate to the top of the legs and it kind of all relates to each other so the most that you can work on the actual figure I find is better because you can get the scale correct you can get the angle correct and sometimes I used to find that you'd make a foot and you'd almost be trying to scrape back so that you could really get the angle right in the beginning my feet were always way too big and even though you are measuring and, and measurements obviously help a lot but nothing can really help as much as actually just visually seeing what something looks like but I would say if you are just starting out making the feet separate is good I did that for years so I don't think it's a bad thing really and I think it's very helpful when you start to make your feet separately because it's fiddly and when you're just starting out you're still learning how to do everything and it can be helpful to have a foot separate like you do with the head where you can turn it around and get to all the angles very easily so i really have only started making feet on the figure in the last two years probably then for the rest of the figure her legs are crossed i did decide to work on a lot of the limbs separate so i used my armature where you can remove the arms and legs until you're ready to set them in place and i worked on the arms and the legs separately once they were done i could then put them all back onto the figure and fill in the parts that hadn't been sculpted yet and I usually I do this when the figure is very complicated like it, the pose is very complicated and a cross-legged pose is very very difficult it's almost I would say maybe impossible to get into all the, the, the areas and get it right when the limbs are sort of crossed over each other and things at least getting the mass of the raw clay on the bulk of it onto the limbs while they're off the sculpture and then sort of put them on with most of the clay there and most of the shape done and then just refine it when they're all stuck on or glued on so at the end when I'm happy with all of the limbs then I can glue everything in and then I'll add the raw clay to the areas that I hadn't sculpted because they were off the body if that makes sense so that's what I did with this one I think I find arms the most difficult thing to sculpt because of the bones in the arm and the way they twist depending on the angle of the hand I personally just find that probably the most difficult thing to get correct and I think I'm still working on that <laughs> I still think I haven't you know after 15 or so years I'm still working on getting the arms uh, better and anatomically better I do still sculpt the hands off the body that is one thing I should probably mention I would find it just almost impossible to make hands on the body you really do need them to be off so you can turn them around you can you know sort of hold them at any angle while you sculpt each finger especially if you're making long nails like this one she had longer nails so you had to add pieces of clay to make the nails afterwards and also you can obviously bake them in stages adding nails I would bake the hand first and then add the nails afterwards so for hands I still do make them off the armature first or off the the body first and then add them afterwards she was a very fiddly one to work with because because she didn't have her legs on so I had to hold her quite a lot of the time to add the clay to the torso and I don't like doing that it's not comfortable compared to having it on the sculpting stand but it just was the only way with this one and sometimes that is the case if it's a very complicated if the limbs are all kind of curled in on each other it's just it, sometimes it has to be done but it's definitely not my favorite way to sculpt I always sculpt by adding small pieces of clay building up when I first started I didn't do that I find that it's much easier now I think to build to rather add clay then have a mass of clay and then have to try and take away and find the shapes out of this mass of clay I sort of add the pieces slowly and build the shapes up rather than kind of cut them out of the clay so here I am adding the legs to the foot and with these ones it was all right I only sculpted the very small bit of foot at the bottom so there wasn't a lot of clay that would have to get taken away if I needed to add more or change the angle of the foot once it was actually on the leg of course it's still not on the body properly so there's always that but I think it worked out quite well with this one so what I'm saying about the foot is that nowadays I find it easier to sculpt the foot on the the body but I have for years and years actually sculpted the foot separately and I have not had too much trouble 
with you know adding it to the leg it's just that because I've been doing it for a long time I just feel that it's just more comfortable and easier to get it and accurate for me now to uh, sculpt the foot on the body so I'm just building up taking away looking at my reference a lot of the time so I always always work from a reference and if if it can be a real life photographs then that's the best but I also sometimes use 3d computer generated images I actually find those can be quite nice too for real anatomy though you definitely are best of looking at real people female anatomy for the artist is a wonderful website which gives you poses in eight different angles of one pose so you can really see the pose from many angles because really I could not work without that I could not lean on my imagination or my memory to uh, know what the what the body's doing it it would be impossible for me so I always work from some form of reference that I can see from many angles I still use my favorite tools these metal tools are still my absolute favorite tools and they have been from the time I started sculpting about as I say about 15 maybe more than 15 years ago now they just they just always I always go back to them so eventually I put her onto the sculpting stand and as I can see I uh, actually held her body up by some old raw clay to sort of fasten her in place and then I could uh, get her onto the sculpting stand it just does get to a point where it's I find it impossible to hold a figure and still try and sculpt. When I started, I used a banana stand, which has just a hook. That was what most people used at the time. And that works quite well. Just use the hook and you have a hook in the head of the, your figure and you hook it on and then, then it holds it on and you can actually work with it. At least you're not having to try and hold the figure yourself. Because as soon as you build up any kind of mass of raw clay, then when you hold it, the heat of your fingers is going to squish. It's going to make it soft. It's just going to mess up the things that you've already done. So this time I had to sort of figure out something to do here and I decided to use my old raw clay to sort of hold her in place. At this point I've now managed to glue in the legs so a lot of the leg is glued in trying to get the foot in the right angle for the pose that I want then once the legs are glued in I can then add more clay and this way with her being held on by the stand I can work on the back as well without messing up anything that I've done on the front I can see that the legs on this one I didn't build up much mass actually before I put them in and that's probably why a lot of the time now unless it is a very complicated pose I don't actually separate the legs. I can see that I added a lot of the mass of the leg while the leg was actually glued in but it was quite useful to have the leg separate for this one so I could do the bottom part of the leg, the, the calf area, separate because those legs have to cross over. It's just a lot of anatomy that you have to sort of get right while they're in place. It's almost impossible. You can imagine you can't get into the back of the leg while it's on. It's going to be very difficult while you also have to make sure that you don't squash the areas that you've already done. So it's it just is very helpful with a complicated pose where the limbs are crossed over each other. I use a lot of cross hatching when I'm sculpting, it's just the way I do it and it helps, I find it helps attach a new piece of raw clay to the, 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 the raw clay on the figure. I find that that cross hatching technique just really works for me. I think everybody's different and I don't think necessarily it would work for someone else. I think you have to really look at a lot of people's techniques and then from all of them you will find your own way. So once smoothing starts I use a big brush in the beginning. It's quite a bristly brush in the beginning to get rid of the basic crosshatch. So I use my mineral spirit, also called white spirit sometimes. It's just what you use to clean up oil paints. I use that first on my widest sort of most bristly brush. Now it's not as bristly as an acrylic paint brush but it's it's almost that at that level and that is quite a good one to sort of get rid of all of the cross hatching texture once I've done that I then take a wide smoother brush so something softer and then go over again with my mineral spirits again to soften and smooth a little bit more and I sort of just use different sizes of brushes and sometimes I take a break because the clay might get a bit sticky and then I have to come back to it because you have to let it kind of dry if it gets too sticky then you're going to miss the details that you've done on your sculpture I find mineral spirit works very well because it helps smooth the area but it also dries quite quickly I think some people use alcohol I find alcohol dries too fast and can dry out your clay and oil for me is another thing people use but for me I find that doesn't dry fast enough and so you, you sometimes you really need that area to dry off so that you can go back in with your brush again and smooth again but if you go in straight away you're going to mess up what you've done because the clay is still kind of soft because it does melt the, 
the surface of the clay. I used Genesis paints to paint her, just like I always do. This was after having baked her, so once I know I've baked for the last time in terms of the clay, then I smooth, obviously, I smooth with some acetone as well before I actually go into painting. So after she's baked and it comes out the oven, I then still have to smooth again. And for that, I use acetone on a cotton pad. I can go into the details of how I do these things in later videos. Just put your questions below and we definitely are going to do Q and A's in the future. So any questions you have, just leave them down below. So once the figure is baked, for the last time the Genesis paint has been baked in the oven 20 minutes then I can add the fabric for the dress for her I just wanted her to have like a really frilly sort of fairy like tutu kind of a skirt and added the hair and for the hair I dyed the hair it's viscose fiber I dyed it so that it was dark at the roots and then kind of getting pinker as it went out and I wanted her to have a very pixie like look her hair started out looking a lot more crazy than it did in the end. I wanted to get a short style and the style that I had in these videos is just a little bit too long still. It just didn't look cute enough or um, modern enough and so I did her hair a few times and had to really sort of cut it down to make it look the way I imagined it. I also redid her teeth which I haven't got on footage because sometimes when I get upset about something and I really need to fix it I don't think about anything even filming gets thrown out the window and um, all I can focus on is just redoing it until I'm happy with it. I did take her teeth out and redo them. When I'm going to make wings I always make little indentations in the back where I'm going to dr drill the holes. It's very helpful to have something to start the drill so a little indentation for the drill to go into because you don't want that drill bit to slip and sort of scratch your hard work. So I just use something like a ball tool, something like that, just press it into the clay to make a little indentation so then when the clay is baked you can go back and use a drill to drill a proper hole that you can then glue a square tube into. I made two pairs of wings for this figure. I then made some wings and the wings fit into the back. I use a square tube in her back and add the wings with a square rod because that way when you put them in they don't swivel around. I ended up making two pairs of wings because I wasn't sure. I remember the night of making these I spent the whole night, I think I was up most of the night, making wings and I made two pairs because I just wasn't happy with the first pair. But you know, that's what happens. Sometimes if you really just don't like something, you kind of just have to do it again because otherwise it will sit in your head forever about how you don't like how you did something. So I just have learned that if I don't like something, I just have to redo it. And I actually sometimes can't even leave something. If I don't like it, I need to redo it. And so I end up just like that night where I ended up staying up most of the night <laughs> making wings. But anyway, at the end of the day, I was happy with them. So that's the main thing. That's the end of this video and I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you for watching and thank you to all my patrons on Patreon for supporting me. I really appreciate every one of you. If you'd like to join me on Patreon, I'd be so happy to welcome you into my studio. I'm currently uploading one hour of sculpting tutorials each month. At the moment, we're making the Salty Mermaid in a cup. The next episode is coming out on the 30th. If you join, you'll also gain access to over 250 videos I've already posted, which include hours of real-time tutorial footage. For example, I document the entire process of sculpting a man, a smiling face, and a child. You can also sign up for my mailing list for free by clicking on the link in the video description. Everyone who signs up gets a free in-depth sculpting a nose tutorial. So thank you so much for watching. Subscribe and click on the notification bell so you don't miss the next video. Thank you. See you again soon.